Thank you for listening to the weekly messages of New Providence Primitive Baptist Church. To subscribe to our podcast, hear other messages, or learn more about us, please visit nppbc.com. Turn with us tonight to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel will be our text. We're going to read from chapter number 2. 1 Samuel chapter number 2. Um, I'll try to keep you with us. I'll tell you the verses I'm going to. I don't want to read all the chapters, so I'm going to get, begin at verse number 12 and um, read several verses. 1 Samuel chapter number 2, beginning at verse number 12. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. The priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. And he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. Now, by the way, they did wrong. That wasn't the way they were supposed to take it from uh, the pot. So, Also, before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. That was wrong as well. And if any man said unto him, Let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth, then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Wherefore, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child girded with a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife and said, The Lord give thee seed of this woman for the loan which is lent to the Lord. And they went to their own house. And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters, and the child grew before the Lord. Verse 22, Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he said unto them, Why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear ye make the Lord's people to transgress. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him, but... If a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto the voice of their father because the Lord would slay them. We'll stop there. Father, we pray that you'd open our heart to this truth. We're trusting you to place it in our heart and to challenge us, God, with this hard question. May we see ourselves as you see us. May we see, Father, where we're missing the mark and where we failed. We thank you for this as we trust for the unction to stand with it. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter number 23, Jesus said these words, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, For ye are likened unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Verse 28, even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. I've just a simple question tonight, and I'll try not to be long. Don't feel like we will be. 
But the question, is there hypocrisy in his house? Is there hypocrisy within his house? The first chapter of Samuel certainly focuses on Samuel. Uh, Chapter number one, we read about Samuel's mother who had gone before the Lord with her husband every year as he brought sacrifice into Shiloh under the high priest Eli and offered that sacrifice there. And you remember how that Hannah had prayed unto God. She did so uh, without speaking, but in her heart she prayed. Her lips were moving, but there was no sound. And Eli, seeing her from his point of view, thought she had been drunk and he told her to stay off the wine. And she had assured him, she said, I've not drunk a thing, but my heart is broken. My heart is burdened. And she told him her heart that she desired a man of the Lord, a man child. And, and the Bible said that Eli granted her request. And you know the story how that she conceived and bare a son and, and his name was Samuel. And Samuel uh, by definition, means lent to the Lord. And so uh, when he was weaned, she brought Samuel back to the house of God, just as she told Eli she would do. She promised him, when the child is weaned, I will give him to the Lord. <laughs> and she did. Uh, here's the place in the service that we'd like to just stop and preach about how wonderful it is for you to give your children to God. And I believe today that that is still a solid biblical truth. The best thing you can do with your children is give them to the Lord. Every day that you can, take them to to the Lord's house and give them to the Lord. Let God work out in them what needs to be done. Let the Lord and the Holy Spirit work in them in such a way that uh, they find their own salvation in fear and trembling. But uh, Samuel wasn't dropped off at a good place. Samuel was took to the house of God, but he was took to a house of hypocrisy. He was took to a place where everything was being done wrong. And little Samuel was being raised up right in the middle of it. Now, I'm certainly encouraged. I believe the best place we can have our children is right here in the middle of this church, involved in everything that we can. And I'm not of the... Opinion that some are that you can take them too much. I despise the thought myself. I don't believe you can get a child in front of God too much. I don't think you'll ever go wrong by taking some a, chil- a child or children to the Lord. And I believe we ought to continue to practice that. I'm I'm glad they're here with us tonight. There Amen. may be some of them will nod off and go to sleep before the message does. All right. Amen. They'll catch some of it. But I'll tell you what they will notice is they'll see some old people loving Jesus. Yeah. They'll recognize there's something about this that uh, that is real. And I believe even in their little hearts, they'll know there's something about Jesus. Sister May was telling me this morning that when uh, it was all going on, when the, so many was on the altar and we're praying this morning, and uh, that uh, I believe one of, I'm not going to call her name lest I embarrass him, one of the little ones scooted in beside her and put his hand in around his great-grandmother, and he got in good and tight. And she said, now, normally he wiggles a great bunch, but he's real still. And she said, I believe he could feel what was going on. You know, they don't know yet what's going on, but I believe they're getting a sense. And I'd sure like for mine to know that there's a God and he's real. But old Samuel got dropped off in a bad place. I'm telling you, they lived in the time, you see, at the end of the judges. You can read in the book of Judges, and every time you get to the end of one of them books, you'll hear, uh, you'll hear the writers say, now there was no king in Israel. Never man did what was right in his own eyes. And there had great corruption arose within the house of God. Eli was the high priest and certainly a man of God, certainly a man that had been used of God. But one thing he failed to do, and that was to teach his own children the right way. And they were raised up. Uh, for him to know what was right. But there was hypocrisy in the house of God, and that's where little Samuel was dropped off. I believe uh, certainly he was a young man, certainly before, maybe just before his teenage years. I believe that's when she gave him back to the Lord, and he began to minister unto God there. He began to minister to Eli, the high priest. But uh, what we find is that uh, he was being taught things from uh, the ungodly children of Eli, and, uh, the Bible said their names were Hophni and Phineas. You 
We started there in verse number 12. And what we find in verse number 12 is that the clear problem with Hophni and Phinehas were they didn't know the Lord. They didn't know the Lord. They didn't love the Lord. According to the word of God, they were sons of Belial, which means they were uh, they were for certain hypocrites as they would come and do uh, the ordinance of God, as they would receive the sacrifices from the people of God. Instead of offering it up unto God, they would steal the sacrifice and they would take it to their own homes and they would feed their own families and feed others and, and have a big uh, party with the sacrifices that were given. And they did it so much that people began to abhor giving a sacrifice unto God. And the Bible said there, as I read to you, that the Lord knew what was going on and that it uh, certainly had uh, upset God and he was fixing to do something about it. But I'm going to ask us a question tonight. Is there hypocrisy in his house? That's a question we've got to answer each one of us. We've got to look inside of our heart to make certain, friend, that we're not playing the hypocrite. There certainly have been hypocrites and remain so throughout the history of the church. Even in the day that we read here, you'll find that these men claim to be men of God. They claim to do the work of God, but everybody knew that they were living an ungodly way. People knew what was going on. May I say to you tonight, Uh, that if you think for one minute that people don't understand or know, uh, friend, when you're living one way and yet saying another thing, uh, that there's a problem, friend, I believe it's clear. According to the word of God, uh, Jesus said that everything that's hidden shall be uncovered. Uh, Friend, if you're trying to hide something from God, uh, that's the very thing that's going to come out. The best thing we can do is to get right with God and repent of hypocrisy if it's present in our lives. Now, I don't know your heart tonight, but I know this. There's a great number of people that'll look at others and they'll smile and they'll say, I'm right with God and know all the time that they ain't right. They'll tell you that there ain't nothing wrong with them. They'll tell you that uh, they're doing just fine. They'll tell you, they'll tell you that them and the other uh, man above are doing just well and their relationship is fine when all the while there's something going on in their heart and they have no spirit inside them and there's a troubling uh, a conviction in their soul. That's hypocrisy. Amen. To say one thing and to know another is hypocrisy. Amen. And it was full in the house of Eli. There was a priestly hypocrisy going on with Hophni and Phinehas. They were certainly bringing an abomination before God. They were stealing the sacrifices. Now, they're two brave men. I'll tell you right now, but they found their end. They were two brave men to steal the sacrifices that were offered unto God. Can you imagine a man being the one that would steal from God? Can you imagine in your mind being in the one that says, I'm the one that gives uh, the instructions. I'm the holy man. I'm the one that's going to direct you. And yet when they come in there, uh, they would steal the sacrifice and they would tell them, look, if you don't give me that sacrifice, I'm going to take it by force. And they'd force some of the women to lay with them uh, before they ever went in the temple. I tell you the most ungodly things that you could ever imagine. I hate to say it, but it could happen in the very church. There needs to be a cleansing within our hearts to make sure that hypocrisy is not in his house. We need to be clean and right with God. We need to be open in a way that the Lord God can see us, but also our neighbor. Or when we say something, we ought to be able to back it up with a life that lives it. According to the word of God, Hophni and Phinehas, they were robbers of God. The Bible said that when Uh, Eli had got word of it. The scripture said that when he found out they were laying with the women at the temple, uh, which obviously was an ungodly use of their authority, right? They were forcing these women to do these, uh, to fornicate and to do these ungodly things. And I, you know, when, when I think about how awful things can be, it starts when somebody don't know God. I'll tell you right now, the dangerous, most dangerous thing could ever happen is for a pastor to be unsaved. You say, well, Lord, surely nobody would go into the preaching business <laughs> on purpose. That's the way I felt about it, right? I, I didn't pick this calling. But there's some, I'm afraid, that they, they seem born to do it. And I believe they're children of the enemy. I really do. I believe that there's some that never been born again that stand behind a pulpit 
tickle people's ears and, and do the things that seemingly please and draw a great crowd and all the while they'll steal him from God. It ain't the first time you've ever heard of this. Within my own lifetime, I've heard of men having embezzled from their own churches hundreds of thousands of dollars. I've heard the testimonies of ungodly and wicked hearts, amen, that have stolen from God. How in the world can you get brave enough to steal from the Almighty? I want you to know that there is a perilous condition that plagues many people in many churches across this land today. And it's hypocrisy in the house of God right. needs to be cleaned up, will be. It'll be cleaned up. Well, according to the word of God, everything unco- or covered up, he said, I'm going to uncover it. Yeah. yeah, they're found out. They're found out. But oh, the, the tragic and, and terrible wake of destruction they leave when it happens. All the people that trusted in them and trusted in their leadership and their authority all of those that followed after him and, and, and served or maybe worked in that church, many of them probably saved and give all their heart to that church just to find out that somebody that was leading the thing was corrupt in their hearts and they didn't know God, you see. They were also sons of Belial. You say, surely to God that can't happen. It does happen. And we need to be careful that we recognize that there needs to be a purity in our hearts. There needs to be a living. I'm talking about a man of God ought to be a man of God on Monday, the same as he is on Sunday. You ought to live it and walk it and preach it and teach it every day of the week. There ain't a day off from being a child of God, friend. Otherwise, it's just hypocrisy in his house. I'm afraid today that some take it too lightly, the calling of God and those things that God has engaged and employed us to do. I believe we take too lightly the importance of holiness and how we're to live. There was hypocrisy in the house when Samuel was dropped off and the young man had to live in that. But I want you to notice in the scripture, uh, we, we caught a couple of them in the simple chapter or the short chapter that I read or the part of it. Well, every time it said that Hophni and Phinehas had done such abominations before God, he'd come back and he'd say, but Samuel, the child, grew before the Lord. You say, how in the world did the child make it and amongst that kind of hypocrisy going on? I'll tell you how he made it. There's a mama somewhere. Amen. Her name was Hannah, and I believe she was praying for that boy every day of the week. I believe every day she went down on her knees praying for Samuel. Even when she had three other sons and a couple of more daughters, ended up having five children. The woman that was barren ended up with six, including Samuel. And I believe she was praying for him. You say, how do you know? Because she is making him a coat. She is making him a coat all that year. And every year she would go and give him that little new coat, a coat that was bigger than the last one, a coat that would fit him for the next year, a coat that would comfort him and remind him that she was, let me tell you something. We live in a world of hypocrisy. Makes me sick. It makes me sick. We live in a world of people that'll pat you on the back and tell you one thing when all the while they have a motive that is wicked and corrupt. But I want you to know that my God knows the difference. And I also want you to know that my God has the ability to preserve my grandchildren and to raise them up in the admonition of the Lord and to teach them those things they need to know. And in spite of the hypocrisy of this ungodly and wicked world that we live in, if we've got praying mamas and praying daddies, there's still hope for our children today. Don't give up. No, the Bible said that Samuel grew in wisdom before the Lord and he ministered unto the Lord. First it said he ministered before the Lord. Then it said he ministered unto the Lord. I want you to know God was getting the good out of young Samuel. He might have been raised up in the house of hypocrisy, but I'll tell you right now, there was a mama's prayers and there was a good God that had a hand upon him and he was somehow or another sheltering that young man and from his little mind, from being corrupted, from the things of this world. I'll tell you, it's only hope our next generation is God. If the mamas and the daddies are praying and God's good hand are on our children to preserve them from the wickedness and the ungodliness around. I tell you the agendas of most in this world today are corrupt at the very core. You say, preacher, you've grown pessimistic in your old age. No, I'm not pessimistic. I'm realistic. It just so happens it's true. It just so happens 
friend, that, that we are corrupt from the highest portion of our government from down to the bottom of it. Our court systems are corrupt from the supreme down to the appellate. Our school systems are corrupt from the top to the bottom. Now, I realize that in, in, in our in our court system, in our government, and in our school systems, God's put saved men and women to try to make a difference. And I'll tell you right now, I thank God for them. <laughs> Amen. They, they're living in there. As, they're living among the wolves. I can tell you that much. Because just as we were talking in Sunday school this morning, if you were to come right out and say what you thought, well, they'd probably hang you or, or for sure fire you. But I want you to know that we, are, we have a job to do, and it has nothing to do with the hypocrisy of this world. I believe we can make a difference as men and women of faith, and I believe we can set our focus and our heart on these young ones that are around us. Listen, if a generation is to survive, I don't have that much longer on this earth, but I will know that when I leave this world, there's going to be some little children, some young men and women that have got a heart for God, that have been touched by the good hand of God that have been paid by the prayers of a praying mother and a praying father, somebody a praying grandmother, a praying grandfather, somebody cared enough to pray that God would protect their heart and their mind from the hypocrisy of this world. Oh, but we need to keep it out of his house. The best thing we can do is to live pure before God's eyes, to live in a way that is holy before him. Listen to me. You don't have to explain or tell me what you do, what you do wrong, what you do right. It ain't none of my business, really, other than to say this. When it comes to the house of God, there ought to be more doing than saying. When it comes to the house of God, our lives ought to say without our lips having to move. There ought to be something in your lifestyle that says to this world, I ain't pulling your leg. I believe he's real. I believe he's real. Hoffman and Finnish said the problem was they was lost. It goes back now to first the priestly failure, but also a, parent, a, parental, a parental failure. Eli had a responsibility to raise his children. He didn't do it. That's on him. I'll tell you right now, if you're a parent, you've got a responsibility to raise your children right. Amen. If you, if you shortcut, let me guarantee you, you'll get a shortcut response. You'll get a shortcut end to that. You can't shortcut parental work. It takes it all the time. And until even when they're grown, you're still trying to help them. But then comes grandkids or, or their kids. And I'll tell you right now, there's, there's always a something that we ought to be careful about because I'll tell you, when it comes to hypocrisy, it is a wicked and it is a vile root that takes heart in people and they believe their own lie and they think they're okay. And friend, they go on about their business and they're dragging people into hell as they go. Hypocrisy is a dangerous thing. Jesus was so upset with the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees that he called them out for it. He never, I don't believe he ever missed an opportunity to call them out. As a matter of fact, I believe the spirit of God and the purpose of God all along was so intent to expose them that John the Baptist came out of the wilderness preaching it. When they showed up to him, when he was baptizing in Jordan, he looked out there and saw them, and he greeted them real kindly. He said, oh, you generation of vipers. You know serpents are the sneaky ones, right? You know the serpents are the ones that slither around, and, and they want to look fine, but they're dangerous in the end. You serpents, you, you generation of vipers, who hath warned you? Who hath warned you? Jesus addressed their hypocrisy, and he said, you make me sick. He said, you act like you're righteous, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. He said, you're just like a whited sepulcher. You're clean, and it's white, and it's beautiful, and it's everything on the outside, but as soon as you roll that stone away, it stinks in there. There's some corruption in there. There's some rotting decay inside of that tomb. You say, preacher, that don't go on here. I hope to God it don't, but we need to be about his business and make sure that it don't. We can't have hypocrisy in his house. I'll tell you how God deals with hypocrisy because he dealt with Hophni, Phinehas, and Eli. 
He dealt with them quite severely. The Bible said just after I stopped reading in verse number 25, you'll find in verse number 26 that there was a man came to Eli and he told Eli straight up, he said, God's ended your rule. He said, your two sons are going to die on the same day and you will as well. And he said, God will end your lineage as priest right now. He's fixing to stop it. Now that was the death sentence that was placed upon those three men, a dad and both of his sons. The Bible said you'll remember in chapter number three when God began to call Samuel. Remember that story? Called him four times. Samuel, he said, and Samuel would jump up and run into Eli and say, you called? He said, no, I didn't, son, lay back down. Remember? And on the third time, he went in there and he told Eli, he said, you called? And he said, no. But the Bible said Eli perceived it was God. And he said, listen, when you go back, he said, you lay down. And he said, when you hear it next time, he said, here I am, Lord. Thy servant heareth. You know what he heard? Next thing he heard was his name called twice. And again, it was the Lord God. And he said, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel rose up and he said, Here I am, Lord, thy servant heareth. And you know what he told Samuel? Just what the other man had said. He said, Eli is fixing to be gone. I'm fixing to deal with Eli and the hypocrisy in my house. You don't think God deals with hypocrisy that way? Let me introduce you to a man and a woman named one Ananias and the other Sapphira. In the book of Acts, when they were all selling what they had and bringing the, the, the contribution to the church and they were giving everything to the church and they came before Peter, Ananias did, and he had this big sack of money and he handed it to him. He said, hey, I sold my stuff and here's everything. I want to give it to the church. And you know what? The Holy Spirit spoke to the apostle Peter and he said, that ain't everything. He lying. He lying. No, Peter looked at him. He said, why? Why has Satan filled thine heart that you would lie to the Holy Ghost of God? And the Bible said, oh, Ananias fell dead right there on the spot. You said, boy, thank God he don't deal with us that way anymore. You sure he don't? Now, ain't you sure what God does or he don't do? when it comes to taking people out of this world, but I'll tell you one thing, I don't want to be guilty of, and that's hypocrisy. I don't want to be guilty from stealing from the house of God. Say, preacher, I don't steal from God. Well, according to the Old Testament, he begged their pardon. He said, you should have been tithing and you ain't. For that, you got holes in your pockets and you can't ever make things meet You can't ever get it right because you won't ever do what's right. You won't ever give as you've been given to. You won't ever open your heart and be true about it. Listen, I don't believe God trying to raise money. He don't need your money. He's trying to raise children. He's trying to raise obedient servants. And brother, giving is part of that obedience. And whatever it is you work out with God, you best be sticking to it. That ain't none of my business what it is, right? I got my own tithe and testimony. But whatever it is you've committed into God, you better stick to it because it's your commitment. It's your vow, right? Whatever it is, it don't make no difference if it's a dollar. If God's pleased with that, I'm pleased. It don't make any difference. What I'm trying to get at is hypocrisy is saying you do one thing when you do another. And hypocrisy can exist in the house of God. And it's a dangerous thing. Ananias and Sapphira found out. Eli and Hophni and Phinehas found out. The Bible said the Philistines rose up against uh, the people of Israel and they went out to fight them and the Philistines whipped them, killed 4,000 of them. They come running back. Some of them said, hey, I got a good idea. Let's grab the ark of God. They won't defeat us if, uh, if we take the ark of God down there with us. Well, I tell you right now, God ain't your paper boy. Amen. He ain't working at your bequest When you take the ark of God, you better make sure God's behind it. You better make sure it's his will. You've got it because when you're acting in your own accord, you're going to find out what Hophni and Phinehas did is that God ain't fighting no battle for a hypocrite. So they grabbed the ark of God and they headed back down there. They're going to fight them Philistines again. We'll get them this time. The Philistines heard them shouting when the ark of God come into camp. 
Oh, we've got it now. Here comes the ark. We're going to win. And the Philistines, they started, they started getting nervous. They said, oh, that's the ark of God. That's the thing that led them across the, on dry ground from Pharaoh's army. And they defeated all of them. And, and they stood up and told one another, said, quit you like men and be strong. And you know what? They, they set into beating them. And they killed 36,000 of the Israelites. And they dropped the ark and ran. Philistines took the ark down to their own house. But the Bible said one old boy come struggling right back into Shiloh, had earth on his head, bleeding, tore up. He come running back into Shiloh. They said, what happened? What happened? And he began to try to tell them. And Eli saw him out there and he, he got him over there. He said, tell me all that happened. Tell me all of it. And he told him, he said, the ark of God, they took it down there. See, that's what Eli was afraid of. Eli was afraid if they took the ark of God, the enemy would get it. They took the ark down there. You say, why are you saying this? Because it's a tragic ending to hypocrisy. Oh, it's so not necessary. All you got to do, friend, is be honest. And I'd rather God whip me till the truth comes out than to have to prove me a hypocrite. I'd rather be chastened by God and be right in heart than to live a lie and steal from God. As I tell you right now, we all get chastened. And according to the word of God, we get chastened because he loves us. And as the right parent and a good parent... He don't look the other way when I do wrong. He chastens me. Bible said he got that young man over there. He said, tell me what happened. And he told him, he said, we went to fight against them. They took the ark of God down there. And he said, they killed 30 and 6,000 of them. He said, both you boys hopping and finished both dead. They're dead. And he said, by the way, they also took the ark. And when they took the ark, when he told him they've taken the ark of God The Bible said Eli was an old man, stricken in years, but he was a big man too. And sitting on that big seat there in the judgment place at the gate, the Bible said he just passed out, fell off his seat, broke his neck, and he was dead. God solved the problem. According to the book of Samuel, all the people had already known in their heart that God was grooming Samuel as prophet and priest. You don't think the world don't know. What's well, the one thing that keeps a bunch of people out of church is because you go to the workplace and you say, I'm a Christian, and then tomorrow at the lunch break, you're cussing with them. You're going along with every ungodly thing that's going, and you think for a minute they don't pick up on that that they don't try to match the two. He says he's a Christian, but he acts just like I do. Then you ask one of them why he don't come to church. He says, just full of hypocrites. Are there hypocrites in the house? It's time we get honest before God. Now, you can say one thing. You can tell me. I'll tell you right now, I've been lied to and convinced many a time. And that's all right. I'm just gullible that way. I tend to try to love people, and if you want to lie to me and tell me a lie, I'll probably try to believe it. But then there's the truth. It always seems to come out. Then there's the truth. Some people ain't even smart enough to keep it off social media. They tell everybody in the world how close they are with God and then get on social media and cuss like a sailor. You see what I'm saying? The last thing in the world that we need in this church is hypocrites. But it's easy to become one. It takes one day of not being honest about your heart. 
one day. And you can sacrifice everything you've lived for to be a witness for Jesus Christ in one day. You know when you when you lie to people about your relationship with Christ and they figure you out, they will never believe you again. It don't matter how right you get after that, how much you confess to the church and you get restored and, and, and everything's, that poor lost person out there, all they know is you're a liar. And they'll use that excuse as they get pitched right on into the flames of that place. And I've got to believe we'll stand before God one day with blood on our hands because we wasn't honest about our hearts. Is there hypocrites in the house? It's easy to become one, but we just got to look at the definition. If we ain't what we say we are, that place in between is hypocrisy. You say you're a Christian? Do you live like one? Do you talk like one? I'm going to mess with you right now. Do you dress like one? When the world sees you, are they bewildered by your speech? That's one way they knew that the disciples were of the Lord, said their speech betrays them. We can tell by the talk that they've been following Jesus. We need to be real about our own hearts. You don't have to look at your neighbor and say, I've been a hypocrite. That ain't none of his business. Hers. But you better look at God with this and say, I'd like to get this cleaned up before the destruction begins, before the before the uncovering that God so carefully does. Listen, God's not fooled by hypocrisy. And we've come too far. I, I had to quit. I was praying. I don't know if anybody listens to me pray, but I sure prayed it tonight. I said, God, I don't know why you're having me preach this, but I'm going to preach it. I believe we're on the I believe we're on the corner of seeing a breakthrough of a revival like we've never seen. But hypocrisy will stop it. Sin will stop what God's trying to do. What God did this morning in this place. I believe He's wanting to magnify that. I believe He's wanting to blow that so big that the lost people can't stand it no more. They run to God. But hypocrisy puts all that in jeopardy. People waltzing in here. As if they're as close to God as you could be when all the while they know, they know, they know that their heart ain't right. They've got sin in their life and they won't let go of it. May I say to you tonight, you're putting in jeopardy what God's trying to do. And that makes it terribly, terribly important to all of us. We need revival. Listen, I know know churches all across this land are sick, but we're sick too. (laughs) Do you feel what I... Let's wish... God help us. We need him to work. We need him to blow this thing open. We need the Holy Spirit to set these fields on fire. But hypocrisy will stop it. Sin in the camp will cause God to stop fighting our battles. We cannot allow. We cannot allow. I don't want it to happen on my watch for certain. But it's not about that. I've got a, I've got a pastoral duty. And if I come to you and, 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 and there is a difference between the way you're living and what you're saying you live, you ought to expect me to come to you and check you. The problem with Eli is he never, 
He never addressed it with his children. He let it go. He let it slide, and he let it slide. And when he finally had to say something, he only did it because he was for- there fornicating with women outside the door. He should have fired both of them right on the spot and said, don't ever come back, at least until you know God. But he didn't. He messed around with sin, and they were all three killed. They were all three judged. Come get a soul. Is there hypocrisy in the house? The question is, is it, is it in our heart? Are we like the whited sepulchers that that Jesus condemned? He, he judged the Pharisees because of their hypocrisy. As a matter of fact, when, when the multitudes were gathered, Jesus stood up when thousands of people around him and he looked in the eyeballs of his 12 and he said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. What he said their problem was. The leaven of the Pharisees, he said, is hypocrisy. They say there's something that they are not. God help us. The simple invitation tonight, if you know of anything in your life that don't match what you're saying. Now, it's one thing for you to look at your neighbor and say, I'm the rottenest sinner and low-down thing you ever met. And then they watch you live and say, well, he's right. He's a pitifulest Christian I ever seen. But at least you, at least what you say matches what you do. Now, I ain't saying it's right, but at least it matches. Hypocrisy is when it don't match. It's when you're lying about your condition. And people do it every day. Let's make sure that we don't have any hypocrisy in our house. All it takes is just being honest with God. Say, here I am. If what the world, what I've told the world I am, if that don't match, I need you to help me right now. I want to get that clean. Would you stand with us tonight if you're here and need the Lord? The altar's open.